do we really know? So here's my outline. I want to introduce, start with some basic stellar dynamics. Um, the central idea of stellar dynamics and explain how this gives rise to the classical view of relaxation and the local approximation which is which is via the local approximation and I want to explain why that approximation is very weak then I'll introduce the Valesco Linard equation for um, stellar systems and explain why the mere form of that equation changes your picture of how relaxation occurs I'll talk about the application of the Balesco Leonard equation by Fouvry et al to thin disks and about the application of, this, of the equation um, um, by Hamilton et al and by uh, uh, Jun Lau and myself to globular clusters. And then I'll say some things about what we might do next uh, to better understand this phenomenon, which I think is rather in flux now. So I'm going to be talking a lot about three papers um, that are being led by students I've been involved with. That's uh, Jean-Baptiste Fauvry et al. in 2016, um, Chris Hamilton et al. in 2018, and Jun and myself uh, last year. And I think, um, yeah. So the central idea of stellar dynamics is that to the lowest order, the lowest approximation, uh, a body of a system made up of more than about 100 bodies should be considered to be collisionless. That is to say that particles, which I shall call stars, but of course might be dark matter particles in reality, move in the system's mean field, mean gravitational field. What do we mean by that mean field? We mean the gravitational field that's generated by the probability distribution in real space, rho of x and t. So it's not the it's not the gravitational field that's produced by the actual distribution of particles, it's the gravitational field that's produced by the, by the probability distribution associated with those particles. Right. So we know from n-body experiments that systems of decent number of particles, like 100 bodies, if you set them up in some reasonably random initial conditions, they quickly settle to a steady state. They settle in a, in a few crossing times to a steady state, a quasi steady state, in which each star can be thought of as moving on a mean field orbit in which this lowest order approximation is, is, is kind of gives you a worthwhile understanding of what's happening. Then there are fluctuations uh, in, the, in the actual gravitational field uh, around this mean field value. These fluctuations um, are generically can be thought of as just noise. Noise in the gravitational field, in addition to the, the mean gravitational field, cause the stars to randomly walk between mean field orbits. So this is the, this is the uh, generations old picture of how relaxation occurs. And clearly the minimal level of noise in a stellar system is set by the shot noise, the Poisson noise, because we've only got n particles. We haven't got an infinite number of particles. And so the probability distribution, and the probability distribution rho kind of smooths out. It, uh, it doesn't tell you where any particle actually is. It tells you where particles might be found to be. So it's a continuous smooth thing, whereas the uh, the actual distribution is discrete. There are only a finite number of particles and they each carry around um, uh, a Kepler potential, a, a kind of cuspy thing. Now in the real, so the minimal level of noise is set by the shot noise, the Poisson noise. In the real world, there may be other sources of noise that are significant. For example, in the disk of our galaxy, molecular clouds are known to, the gravitational fields of molecular clouds are known to be uh, significant. In clusters of galaxies, there is, the, the people talk about the concept of harassment, which means the fluctuation, the, the, the changes induced on galaxies by the gravitational fields of passing galaxies, other passing galaxies, and so on. So there can be many, in the real world, there are many sources of noise in the gravitational field. Um, in this, uh, in this, uh, Colloquium, I'm going to focus on shot noise, on the noise that, um, that arising because of the discreteness of the particles making up the system, but it should be 
should be borne in mind always that this is just the minimal level of noise. You can, you can only have more noise than that, never less. And the big question is, the question that we want to address is how does the distribution function f of x and v evolve in response to shot noise? So um, this random wandering, this between mean field orbits um, is bound to lead to a diffusion of stars through phase space. And the goal of a theory of relaxation is to explain how that is the probability density of stars in phase space, which is what the distribution function f of x and v is, how it causes that probability distribution um, to evolve. So the, the, the standard theory that you can find in galactic dynamics and elsewhere of um, this, uh, this evolution question goes back to um, Chandra Sikar in 1943 and uh, somewhat significantly modified by Lyman Spitzer um, in the 50s and 60s. And the, the, the central concept, concept is that what happens is that stars scatter off each other by moving on hyperbolic Kepler orbits. So the two stars typically approach each other, um, but they're on unbound orbits with respect to each other because they've been accelerated by the, the mean gravitational field of the cluster. Two stars approach each other with positive mutual energy. And so they scatter off each other by moving along hyperbolic orbits in their Kepler potentials. So we're working in a local approximation. That's to say we're thinking of the encounter as happening in a space which is small compared to the um, to the to the whole cluster, so that um, we, we think of the of the of the stars as approaching each other on straight line constant velocity trajectories and and scattering. And what we then do is um, using this model of scattering and on hyperbolic um, orbits, we calculate the probability p that um, that a star with velocity v suffers a change in velocity delta v um, as a result of an, a collision with some randomly positioned partner. Um, and once you've got this probability p um, for changes delta v in the velocity, you can compute the diffusion coefficients, which are the expectation value of delta v, uh, and that's the called the first order diffusion coefficient. And the second order diffusion coefficient is the expectation value of the square of delta v. So, uh, yeah, that's perhaps all I should say about that. Now, when you when you do this, as described in standard texts, you find that these changes, these expectation values, which are uh, which are going to be the diffusion coefficients that would go into the relevant diffusion equation, are proportional to the logarithm of the maximum impact parameter that you consider because you imagine these two stars coming to each other on straight line trajectories um, so that if they stayed on those straight line trajectories they would miss each other by a distance b met b that's the impact parameter so we consider encounters with small impact parameters and bigger impact parameters and bigger and bigger impact parameters uh, until we get to some impact parameter where we think, oh, uh, this uh, such, such wide encounters perhaps don't matter because they give rise to too little scattering, or such wide encounters can't really be handled in this local approximation. So we integrate from from zero impact parameter up to the up to the maximum impact parameter that we're willing to consider, and unfortunately these diffusion coefficients then turn out to be proportional to the logarithm of Bmax over the impact parameter that would produce a 90 degree deflection and the given velocity at a typical velocity. So um, we end up with a theory which is a little bit uh, unsatisfactory because um, there is a dependence on a parameter Bmax which isn't at all well defined. Fortunately, this dependence is only logarithmic, so we say to ourselves, oh, never mind, we'll just, we'll just take a, a reasonable value for Bmax over B90 and use that. Now, Chandra Sikar thought that Bmax um, should be on the order of the interparticle separation, so that's n to the minus a third, where n is the number density of the particles. 
So the idea there is that um, clearly on such very small scales, um, the interparticle distance, the typical interparticle distance, if two stars, two stars will come closer than that to each other, moderately rarely. So we'll be talking about a reasonably small number of quite large deflections. But Spitzer argued that you should take Bmax to be on the order of the system size. So a much bigger value of Bmax if, if n is a large number. Um, uh, if, if, if the total number of stars in the cluster, sorry, is a large number. Um, and I think numerical experiments, which of course happened after uh, Chandra was writing in 1943 were possible. Uh, numerical experiments indicate that indeed you have to take Bmax to be uh, much bigger than n to the minus a third to get for, for the theory to produce anything like what, ha what you see in numerical experiments. So Bmax does have to be on the order of the system size. And then we have, we have two problems. The first is that the local approximation will not be valid for many encounters. Um, so this logarithmic dependence of the diffusion coefficients on Bmax of a beam 90 tells you that distant encounters even though they produce very small deflections, are so numerous that their aggregate effect is significant. So and distant encounters clearly can't be handled by this local approximation in which we assume that asymptotically the, the velocity, we assume that the two stars approach each other with some velocity and that we don't need to worry in the small distance over which the scattering occurs about the mean field of the cluster. So first problem with Bmax being about the system size is that it, it more or less negates the local approximation. It tells you the local approximation in that regime is not valid. And the second is that, that it, saying Bmax is about the system size, well, exactly how, how, I mean, what do you mean about the system size? Um, is it a third of the system size, the system size, twice the system size, what is it? So, Depending on what you then take, it means the theory isn't really predictive because the, the, the numbers you're computing uh, from which you're going to obtain predictions uh, are proportional or, or involve this parameter Bmax, which you don't really have a proper value for. Now, the issue of scale is very important in that it tells you or it affects the significance of self-gravity. So when Chandra was discussing this, the, uh, the impact of the fact that it was a self-gravitating system was only important in defining or, or telling you about the nature of the mean field system. So telling you what the mean density of the stars was, what their typical velocity was, which they would approach each other. But the, um, when you discuss the two scattering events, you could treat that as two stars scattering in a vacuum. Um, the two stars, of course, are attracting each other, but you don't need to worry about the, the, the gravity supplied by all the other stars in the cluster, which, of course, are what hold the cluster together and what define the velocity at which the two stars approach each other. Two stars are, in Chandra's picture, they're scattering in a very small volume. They're exceptionally close to each other and therefore they're moving through a vacuum. By the time we're, we're talking about Spitzer type scattering, we've got stars scattering uh, at distances which are comparable to the system size, which means that within the orbit, there are many other stars and these other stars are going to be affected by the gravity of the two stars whose scattering we're doing. So we can't think of the two stars as scattering in a vacuum. We now have the two stars scattering in a medium, which is which is affected by the gravitational field of the two stars. Like it's like doing electrostatics, not in a vacuum, but in a dielectric medium. Now the scale on which self-gravity becomes important is the genes length. And the genes length of a, of a system is the system size, right? The genes length of a self-gravitating cluster is the system size. So, so the, the scattering events which have the largest B maxes, the, sorry, the largest Bs, Bs on the order of B max, are precisely taking place in a regime in which self gravity is important. If you, um, uh, if you put gas in a box, um, 
and uh, lower the temperature. Um, so just, just put gas in a box and lower the temperature. When you've got the temperature low enough, the particles will be moving so slowly thermally that the thermal kinetic energy will be so small that the self-gravity of the gas will begin to come important and it won't behave any longer like the ideal gas um, of kinetic theory, right? The ideal gas of kinetic theory in which the pressure is nkt uh, is all about a gas in which the particles essentially don't interact with each other. Most they interact in, in, well, they don't, strictly speaking, they don't interact with each other. But these, these in a, re a real gas at sufficiently low temperature, they will in, the interaction with each other, which happens via gravity, becomes significant. And what this gravity does is make the gas more compressible than, uh, uh, than, a, than it would be for a, an ideal gas in which the stars particles did not interact with each other. So as you, as you lower the, um, the temperature of a, of, a, of a box of gas, the compressibility of the gas will rise above the compressibility that's given by ideal gas kinetic theory until when the, when the box is, the size of the box is the gene scale, the compressibility will become infinite. So this is rather like um, doing electrostatics in a, um, in a medium whose dielectric interest sorry, whose dielectric constant is becoming bigger and bigger. And the point is that when, you're, when the scattering is happening on the scale of the system, um, self-gravity um, shouldn't be neglected, or there's a prima facie case why self-gravity should be considered. Now we've known about this actually for a very long time, at least since um, <coughs> Julian and Tumory in 1966. So in the context of disks, of thin, razor thin disks, the physics of self-gravity is quantified by Tumory's parameter Q. Q, big Q, is the ratio of the velocity dispersion in the disk to the critical velocity dispersion, which is needed to push the gene's length above lambda critical. That's the smallest scale that is stabilized by shear. So in a in a stellar disk, there, uh, there is a great deal of shear. The, the particles on, it's, uh, at, uh, moving on small radius orbits uh, go around typically faster than particles on, on larger radius orbits. And so the, the, the fluid, the um, material in the disk is shearing. And this shearing stabilizes the disk against self-gravity. And lambda crit, uh, it, which in the disk of our galaxy, for example, is on the order of eight kiloparsecs. It's sort of a distance comparable to the distance of the galactic center, is the shortest distance uh, that is stabilized by shear and smaller volumes have to be stabilized by pressure. So Q is the ratio of the velocity dispersion requires, required to, uh, the, uh, the ratio, Q is the ratio of the velocity dispersion actually in the disk the, to the, velocity dispersion required to make sure the thing is stable against just collapsing on small scales. And in a typical disk, uh, stellar disk, Q is a number like 1.3, 1.4, something like that. So Q is bigger than one, it has to be bigger than one, or the disk would sort of collapse locally uh, into blobs. And Julian and Tumory in 66 showed that if you put a cloud, so that's which, which they modeled as a point mass, uh, into uh, a, a one of these disks with a Q of 1.4. So since it has Q of 1.4, it's stable against self-gravity, against gravitational collapse by a good margin. But if you put a cloud in, it gathers an entourage around it, which is 10 times as massive as the cloud itself. So the picture I'm showing uh, at the top, uh, the top right, this picture is copied out of this, it's a classic picture copied out of Julian and Tumory. 66, um, showing uh, a square in the middle, which is the volume of the disk, the area of the disk, which contains the same mass in the undisturbed disk, which contains the same mass as the, um, 
as the cloud that they inserted. And then all around it, there are contours of um, overdensity. Um, there are contours of overdensity um, that are induced in the disk by the um, by the gravity, well, the, the rise because you put the cloud there. So if you took the cloud away, all those contours would dissolve and the disk, uh, the density would become um, just just one everywhere. You put, you put in that cloud and you get these over densities and they showed that this sort of um, integral sign shaped uh, structure here of over density. This, this is a region of under density, under density, and this is a region of over density. This elongated distribution of over density um, has a mass which is 10 times that of the, um, of the cloud that you put in. So what that means is that the effective mass of a molecular cloud in a disk is 10 times bigger than its actual mass because it dresses itself with an entourage of uh, of stars, constantly changing entourage of stars. The actual stars in this entourage aren't the same from one moment to the next. But as one star goes out of the entourage, other stars come in. So, so the the there's actually there's actually a bigger there's a there's a very much bigger uh, fluctuation in the gravitational field of the disk produced by inserting that point mass than the gravitational field of the point mass. So we've known that for a long time. And the, uh, but something that was only shown in 1981 in a conference proceeding by Toomer and Kalnice, that was at IEU Symposium 100 held in, um, in Besançon, um, they showed that individual stars gather such entourages. So if you do an n-body simulation of a disk and you plot the density in the disk, um, you compute the density in the disk uh, many, many times, uh, each time putting a different star at the origin of your coordinate system, and then you stack those densities one on, one on another, you find you find that each, uh, you find that these contours re-emerge. So this, so if you put there not a cloud, you just put one particle, just just one of the particles of the disk, put it in the middle there, uh, and um, compute the and work out what the density is in the in the space around, uh, and then do it again for another star, again for another star, again for another star, and stack all your densities. So e the individual densities will be noisy, but when you stack them, you will see this mean effect, and you'll find that individual stars are carrying around these um, are carrying around these um, entourages of, in a statistical sense, of other stars. So self gravity, uh, we've known since since almost 40 years, that self-gravity is important for fluctuations in disks. So, uh, it, it's clear we need to go beyond the local approximation when discussing scattering, and uh, what do we have to do? Because we need to handle these large-scale scatterings, these scatterings at large impact parameters. How to do it? Well, there are two things we have to do. One is we have to upgrade from straight-line asymptotic orbits. Uh, when we're, when we're discussing a phenomenon on the scale of the system, the orbit can't be approximated, the unperturbed orbit cannot be treated as a straight line trajectory. It's got to be some kind of curved trajectory in the mean field of the system. And the second is we've got to include self-gravity. We've got to bear in mind that stars um, act cooperatively and they all carry entourages around with them. So the mathematical tools that we need to handle this are angle action coordinates and potential density pairs, um, which were, which, whose, whose value in um, computations, especially involving angle action coordinates, was demonstrated by Agris Kalnice in, in a classic 1977 paper. So the stars in our system uh, are going to be moving, uh, 
uh, moving on mean field orbits, a mean field orbit can be assigned three actions. In a spherical system, those will be the radial actions, the total angular momentum and the angular momentum around some chosen axis, for example, in a flat disk, they will be the angular momentum around the symmetry axis and the, and the radial action that quantifies the eccentricity of the orbit. So uh, each orbit is going to be a point in a three-dimensional space which have actions for their coordinates uh, and the state of the system will be defined by a probability distribution in this three-dimensional action space. This probability distribution is nothing other than the distribution function f which is a function of the three actions which I've got symbolized by j uh, and of course it will depend on time because it's evolving. And conservation of stars tells you that the um, evolution of the system is going to be simply that the is going to be here that the um, rate of change of the distribution function is going to be with respect to time is going to be minus the divergence in actions of the flux through action space of stars and this flux flux of actions is going to have this form here it's going to be um, minus some some number first order diffusion coefficient uh, times the the current distribution function minus another number d2 times the gradient of the distribution function with respect to action so in the ordinary heat diffusion equation that every undergraduate is familiar with the first order diffusion coefficient d1 vanishes so that you have and d2 is independent of position so in the ordinary heat diffusion equation we're talking about the diffusion of something through ordinary x y z space so the actions get replaced by x y and z and d2 becomes in the in the undergraduate courses becomes independent of position instead of depending on the actions and so this second partial differential operator passes through d2 and we have that uh, df by dt is equal to minus, uh, sorry, is equal to plus then, because there are two minuses, d2 times the second derivative of f with respect to j squared. So that's becomes del squared heat content, right? So this is a slightly upgraded diffusion equation that one of the upgrades is that the diff this second order diffusion coefficient depends now on position that could easily happen also in the heat diffusion equation in a more sophisticated way. The, um, the uh, diffusion coefficient, for example, would depend on the density of the material that um, you were diffusing through. If it was inhomogeneous, then indeed uh, the diffusion coefficient, the conductivity, that's what T2 would become, uh, would depend on position. But what's more important is, that, is this first order diffusion equation. This first order diffusion equation tells you that there is a that there is a flux even when there is no gradient in the flux there is still a there is sorry no gradient in the distribution function so if you if you have a bar a constant temperature you get no flow of heat if if the gradient of temperature which is is given by the second term is vanishes the flux of heat vanishes but in the case of, of, of stars diffusing through phase space, even if the gradient of the distribution function would vanish, there would still be a flux uh, back towards the origin. That's what this uh, is, proportional to the density of, of stars in phase space. Uh, and this is basically required because in thermal equilibrium, when you reach equilibrium, the stars will be uh, clustered around the origin of action space, around um, low energy orbits and the number of stars will decrease as you go to higher and higher actions as you go to higher and higher energy so this term here will never this second term will never actually go away and it'll always be pushing stars out to higher to higher actions and therefore higher energies and conservation of energy tells you that there has to be a countervailing term pushing them back towards the origin so that you can achieve equilibrium uh, an equilibrium situation where the stars are um, still clustered around the origin. So that's why the diffusion equation takes that, takes that form. Okay, so the problem 
the problem that we have, the mathematical problem, is how to compute these numbers, these diffusion coefficients, D1 and D2. And the first person to do this uh, for a stellar system was Jan Iverts, who sadly died uh, five, about five years later, four or five years later, prematurely. Uh, he arrived at, at the right equation um, through using the BBGKY hierarchy in which you talk about the, um, uh, the, over, the density of pairs and the density of triples and the density of quadruples and all that. Um, Henri Chavani, uh, a couple of years later, gave a derivation that I like better, uh, that doesn't use the BBGKY hierarchy. And last, and, and, and um, this summer, Chris Hamilton uh, gave uh, a sort of a much simpler generic uh, uh, account still that I recommend to you because the, the, the Eva and Chavani papers are quite heavy going. You, they contain stuff that you won't find in, in Chris Hamilton's paper, but if you want to sort of just get a feeling for the physics of it, then Chris Hamilton's paper, I think, is a good go-to place. It's very, uh, very straightforward and easy to understand. And he's, he, he basically takes uh, as his starting point what's called Rostoka's principle, which is that stars interact with each other pairwise using their dressed potentials. Okay, dressed, right, in that sense, that they carry an entourage and that entourage generates a potential so that the potential of an actual star is not the same as its Kepler potential. It's bigger and different from its Kepler potential. So, so, if we, so starting out from that understanding that that's how uh, stars interact with each other in pairs and using their dress, not their bare potentials, uh, Chris Hamilton will derive you uh, the relevant equation. So, Iver called this equation the Palescu Lenard equation after the corresponding equation in plasma physics, but really and truly it ought to be called Iver's equation, I suppose, because he first gave it for a stellar system and it's not quite the same thing. The really important point about the Palescu Lenard equation is that it includes self gravity, which I've argued is essential, and it's complete. There is no nonsense about there being an arbitrary, everything being proportional to an arbitrary Coulomb logarithm. If you could work out the, if you could actually um, compute the quantities which appear in it, you would have a complete and precise prediction for what the, uh, what the flux was through phase space. And therefore you could solve the relevant diffusion equation and there, there's nothing arbitrary, unsettled uh, about it. It's a complete and satisfactory theory um, in a way that the Chandrasekhar Spitzer is not. Now the key formulae of these, these are the formulae, so I'm not going to derive these formulae at all, and I'm, I'm referring you basically to Chris Hamilton's paper to see where, see, get an idea where these come from, but these are, I, the structure of these, of these equations are important. So these are these two diffusion coefficients, D1, which um, simply gets multiplied by F0 to make the flux, so this is the thing that, this is the number that drives the stars back towards low energy, and D2, which is the coefficient of the gradient of the distribution function that drives the, the, the diffusion forward. So what is it? It's, it involves uh, a, an integral. So this is the, this is, the, each of these is a function of action. That is to say, um, it's, uh, it varies from point to point in action space. This gives you the rate of the diffusion at J, of the star at flux at J. And this flux at J is obtained by searching uh, action space for stars which resonate with the, with our star with the star with a star on the orbit that we're discussing right so n dot omega is the is a, is a frequency associated with our star and we're searching action space for other stars because this is the Dirac delta function that resonate with it where this where these two frequencies are equal these n's are integer valued three vectors I'll talk a bit about those later. Um, and, uh, so, and, and the other important point about this uh, equation is this appearance of E n n primed. So the formalism gives you expressions for what E n n primed is. I'm not going to present them here because they're messy. The important point is that these are measures, uh, 
this is this is this is a, a quantity which describes the um, it describes the dressed potentials in a certain way in a certain way. So so it tells us how stars interact uh, via fluctuations at a certain frequency. And it's the inverse of a matrix which vanishes if omega is the frequency of a normal node of the whole system. So, so it, E is, uh, is a description of the dressed interaction of stars and it's a function of frequency. Um, and the frequency in question is the frequency uh, uh, that is being matched here. And both formulae are very, are very similar. They're, they both involve this quantity in the same way. They both have Dirac delta functions. So we don't need to talk about things very, very much else. Okay, so, so the integrals over J prime say that stars interact in pairs. This is indeed two body relaxation. Um, this emerges from the, uh, this is not something you have to put in to the, for example, Chavani paper or the Ivert paper, but you get it out. Um, and the direct deltas say that the stars interact when they resonate. And I've, as I say, ENN tells you that self-gravity enhances the interactions. These things become large. Obviously the inverse of a matrix, which is vanishing, becomes very large as the matrix sort of goes towards vanishing. So when you're near to any kind of a resonance, this thing is large. So gravity enhances the interaction when stars have frequencies near normal modes. So how does the bolesko lenard equation change our, should change our picture and understanding? The key interactions are not local, they're resonant. And I think this, this links to a lot of physics. Resonance is typically, it is what enables weak effects to have a significant impact because when you're on resonance, a perturbation can build over millions of cycles. An example I'm fond of is if you consider the most allowed atomic transition, an extremely allowed atomic transition, for example, the Lyman alpha transition of hydrogen. Um, so this is an interaction between an atom, which is a resonant system, and the electromagnetic waves in the vacuum. And what's a very strong interaction from an atom for an atom, I mean, which we think of as a very strong interaction because Lyman alpha is an extremely allowed transition, but actually it takes, uh, it takes 10 million cycles, 10, 10 million oscillations for a Lyman alpha photon to be emitted. It's actually a very weak interaction between the atom is actually very weakly coupled to the uh, electromagnetic field in the vacuum at the relevant frequencies. Um, and uh, it's precisely because it's weakly coupled that the transition has a well-defined frequency and is and because it's happening through a resonance. And it seems that in stellar dynamics, the same, the same, uh, so in stellar dynamics, if we're dealing with a large end system, the interactions between individual stars then are weak right? The, the, the scale of interaction is set by the mean gravitational field. The gravitational field associated with the fluctuations is weak. And so it's not surprising that this interaction is important precisely when we have a resonance. And so that's one important point. The coupling is, is not local, but resonant. It doesn't pick out stars which are near each other. It picks out stars which are resonantly coupled, resonantly interacting. Uh, and the resonant um, couplings are massively enhanced where the whole system can dance to the beat that, that these two stars uh, are operating at. In, in the local approximation, every octave of impact parameter contributes uh, equally to relaxation. That's the classical spitzer chandrasekhar theory. And, What's happening is that self-gravity decisively tips the scale in favor of the global scale interactions. The global scale interactions, according to Spitzer and Chandrasekhar, are as important as the very small scale interactions, but not more so. But when you bear in mind that self-gravity enhances the, uh, the large scale ones, but not the small scale ones, that's why the, the global scale interactions become important. There's a detailed argument about that in Hamilton et al.
So how do, does, does this work? How does this work? Well, this was first tested out by uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Fogri in his 2016 or thereabouts, 2015-2016 thesis. Uh, and um, what he did was he implemented the bolesco leonard approximation uh, uh, equation to compute diffusion coefficients uh, for a flat rotation curve disk which had cutouts at small and large radii. So this is where you, you the, the gravitational potential is that which generates a flat rotation curve um, and a uh, flat rotation curve and at small radii you assign most of the responsibility for generating this this uh, uh, force field to some bulge or something which you don't simulate or you don't compute and at large radii you associate it with coming from some kind of dark halo so you say the disk is responsible only for generating a significant gravitational field in some intermediate range of radii this is a very standard procedure um, and uh, he also did n-body simulations. He sort of tested things with n-body simulations and compared. So what we have here are a few diagrams which show, uh, first of all, that um, the uh, looking at the scaling with n, which is what's happening here. Here are results for different n's. Uh, here's eight by ten to the five. Here's sixty-four by. Oh, sorry, sorry. I need to go backwards. Here's sixty-four by ten to the five. So um, uh, so, so the top graphs are showing uh, rather rapid relaxation in disks with small numbers of particles, and the bottom graphs are showing plots curves are showing uh, slower relaxation in um, because this is time that's plotted along here in uh, simulations with larger numbers of particles. Um, so it's showing that the relaxation in the end bodies is actually caused by discreteness noise. And this and th the plots on the left are when half, uh, the, when the, when the uh, up uh, at most half of the mass, uh, sorry, half of the force wheel field is generated uh, by the actual particles rather than by dark halo. Uh, and on the right is when 0.6 of, of the interaction is caused. So this is when self-gravity is on the right, self-gravity is more important. On the left, gra self-gravity is less important. And what he did was compute these ratios, which is the, so the, the divergence of the, of the flux is a measure of the relaxation rate. Uh, and so, so uh, this, this is, this is averaged through, um, uh, through action space, uh, through phase space, uh, the divergence of the flux for one value of xi, for, for, for half of the mass being self-gravitating or 0.6 of the mass being self-gravitating. Um, and what he found was in the n-body calculations, um, increasing from a half to 0.6, the amount of the importance of self-gravity caused a 29-fold amplification in the acceleration in the in, uh, in the diffusion rate as measured by this diagnostic. Uh, and the, um, whereas the bolesco leonard equation um, gave an amplification by a factor of 42. So the point here is that the n-body experiments are validating the pairwise interactions uh, and self-gravity is indeed very important. These are not, these are very heavily dressed interactions uh, and the strength of the dressing increases as you increase Xi and make the disk more self-gravitating. So how does it work in the case of globular clusters? This is what Chris Hamilton did for a uh, master's project. Um, and um, so he implemented the bolesco leonard equation uh, for cl spherical clusters which had isochrone distributions and had potentially anisotropic um, distribution functions, distribution functions depending on E and L of the Ozokov merit type. Uh, and here you see um, plots of the um, uh, diffusive flux. This is the first order part and this is the second order part. And on the right here you have the total flux. Let's just concentrate on the total flux um, as a function 
So this is the, 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 this is the flux within action space, how things are moving around uh, in action space for uh, a highly anisotropic cluster uh, on the left and for an isotropic cluster on the right. And on the bottom, you have the flux vectors which, Chandrase which Chandrasekhar's theory produces. And you can see that there's a profound difference between the Chandrasekhar flux vectors and the ones that emerge from the Belesko Lenard equation. And um, so uh, a year later, oh no, so technical issue, why is that? Why do these, why do these differ so much? Is that because Chandrasekhar is just completely wrong? Well, there's a technical problem. And the technical problem is that the Belesko Leonard formula I've shown you give F as a sum over resonant pairs, right? Uh, so there was the, these delta functions, n dot omega minus n prime dot omega prime. And when those two frequencies were equal, we got a contribution. So at what, in order to compute these uh, diffusion coefficients at every action uh, and for every uh, and for every possible integer, ve integer component vector, you have to uh, ask um, you, you, what other integer component vector, for, you then need to consider other integer component vectors and search for uh, an integrate over surfaces of J primed where this resonant condition will be satisfied. So the ar argument of the delta function vanishes and, and, and by integrating over that surface, you get a contribution. And then you have to um, find, uh, so, so you have to cycle over n and n primed. And for each pair, n and n primed, you have to integrate over, a, you do an integral over a surface, which in a two dimensional axiom space becomes a line. Okay. Uh, and in practice, you have to limit n and n primed to vectors with small components. Uh, in a disk or a sphere, in anything that's axisymmetric, symmetric, one component will be the familiar angular momentum quantum number L, the total angular momentum quantum number from, um, uh, from the YLMs. Hamilton summed up to L equals two. That is to say, he summed L equals naught, L equals one, and L equals two. Um, and he found that the largest contribution, the dominant contribution came from L equals one. Whereas the short range uh, scatterings that Chandrasekhar uh, is deriving his whole result from must lie at L very much bigger than one. So the, the Hamilton uh, results, the Hamilton et al results are for a contribution to the diffusion coming from a regime that's not explored by Chandra and which actually excludes the regime that is, which is uh, included in Chandra. So that's it. So it's not a surprise that these differ. It is a bit worrying that these arrows are already, these arrows which come from only L equals naught, L equals one and L equals two are already as big or bigger than these arrows down here. But one, it just isn't technically possible to, um, uh, to use the bilesku leonard equation at the present time anyway, it's not possible to include this part of the, of, of, and, right. So the, the next thing to do is, uh, so what the Hamilton et al. work showed that self-gravity is important in the relaxation of globular clusters um, and suggested that relaxation is dominated by fluctuations associated with the global dipole oscillation. That's an oscillation where the middle of the cluster moves with respect to the envelope. Um, uh, and I, Right, so, so uh, Jun Lao then um, uh, investigated this further by doing direct n-body simulations. So Jun did 10,000 realizations of, of isotropic isochrone clusters with only a thousand particles each and ran the simulations for only three half mass crossing times. So he did a large number of short low n simulations. And compute. for each simulation, he can computed the actions uh, at several points through the evolution. Um, and then stacked the results from, because we're interested in statistical theory, we don't care about individual simulations, individual realizations, we want to know the statistical properties. So you stack all 10,000 simulations together to beat down the noise. Uh, these diagrams basically show that uh, what he was doing makes sense. And because time is very short, I'm gonna skip uh, to the more important things. Um, the, 
the key point is that what you find is that the center or the 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 mo the center of the cluster defined to be the barycenter of the 30 most bound particles so the the place where the potential is is is, is deep wanders from the the place where you the, the what we call the mean field center which was the um the center of the probability distribution which we use to select the initial coordinates and which is guaranteed to be the uh, center of a sufficiently large number of, of, a, of, a, sim, of a realization, a sufficiently large realization of the cluster. Uh, so the center is, is doing a tethered random walk from around the mean field center. It's not gonna wander just completely freely off nowhere it's it's pulled it's tethered it's pulled back towards the mean field center but it is conducting uh, a random walk which uh, continues to amplify so it's just the displacement from the center continues this is, this is shown here this is showing the expectation value of the distance squared from the center as a function of time uh, in the average over all these simulations uh, and this is showing the amplitude of the dipole uh, contribution to the... So what's happening is that the middle of the cluster is wandering away from, the, uh, from where it was set up to be, whereas the outer part of the cluster is not going anywhere very much. So the middle is moving with respect to the outside and creating a dipole um, gravitational field. Um, and this is further evidence Time is very, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going rather fast now, but this is further evidence of this wandering of the, of the middle with respect to the outside. Um, and, but you know, that's just all diagnostic stuff. Here are the hard facts. The hard facts are that you can compute the uh, actions of all these stars throughout the simulation, and you can check that you're your computation is of the actions is is accurate, and then uh, you can uh, you can sh you can average these changes. You can say that the stars uh, um, in this zone, on the average, move like that, and this and, and over here they move like this. So these are the actual displacements, the the expectation values of the changes that uh, uh, Jun found in his n-body, in his 10,000 n-body simulations. And over here we have the Chandrasekhar, um, uh, we have the Chandrasekhar prediction. So basically at large, um, at re at relatively large actions, this is the radial action and this is the angular momentum action. So curves of constant energy run diagonally across the, the picture like this. As you go to, uh, the outside of the cluster, there's sort of agreement, but when you're in the middle of the cluster, which is where you'd expect self-gravity to be important, um, uh, uh, Jun observes much more relaxation than Chandra predicts. Down below are the um, Hamilton et al. Uh, vectors, which are completely different from, from, from both of them for the reasons that I've given, that they don't include the high, um, they're, they're confined to these small um, integer vectors. This is a blow up of the, so this is showing on a, on a smaller scale, the, um, the diffusion in the middle of the cluster happening rapidly in the real, in the, in the end body simulation where Chandra says there shouldn't really be any, any flux. So uh, Chandra predicts the overall picture better than Hamilton. So clearly leaving out these, these um, local scatterings, which Hamilton, which Hamilton's obliged to do for technical reasons, um, is a is a is a mistake, or it's it's bad, has bad effects. But um, but but Chandra significantly underestimates the relaxation in the core, which is where you'd expect self self gravity to be important. Um, and a, a, a significant point for me is that even after three half mass crossing times. Um, Jun's simulations were unnaturally symmetric. You start the, you, when you start an n-body simulation by sampling a mean field model, an analytic model, you set it up with a degree of symmetry uh, 
which actually is unrealistic because when you let it go, self gravity will allow little over, over densities to appear in the middle to move with respect to the outside. Um, right. So, what, where should we go now? Well, I think more, I, I would love to do more end body experiments along the lines that Jun did of doing ensembles of simulations, um, different realizations of statistically equivalent um, models. I think. We've got a lot to learn in stellar dynamics by, by doing that, not um, uh, simulating the same system again and again and again with different initial conditions and computing the J, the J space flux. As far as I can make out, until Hamilton et al, nobody had actually computed what the J space flux was that, that um, Chandra predicted. It's actually quite difficult to compute from Chandra's theory, which maybe is why it didn't, hadn't been done, but I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, something that we really, what we should, we should try hard to do is to carry the, the, the Balescu Leonard sum to higher n somehow and or combine uh, a Balescu Leonard sum at low n with um, Chandra type results computed to a relatively small B max. So include the, the local, um, include the near encounters um, uh, using the Chandra thing when they're valid um, and carry, but, but deal, use the Balescu Leonard equation to deal with the large impact encounters which Chandra can't do properly. Um, but the other thing to do, which I, I had hoped to talk about, but I can't now because I, I've just heard the clock downstairs chime, it's time for me to stop. Um, but is to develop a deeper theory of the thermal excitation of clusters. So um, this, will, this will unfortunately have to go. Let me go to my summary. Um, so the important point is that large scale fluctuations are significantly amplified by self gravity. And I think we've neglected, we've not paid enough attention to this phenomenon. They increase the rate of two body relaxation in a typical disc by several orders of magnitude. That was the conclusion um, of uh, Fauvry et al. And, um, and that work explained what had been a mystery until then, a mystery to people like Tumere and Kalnice, that when you set up a completely uh, a, a disc that you could prove was in a normal mode sense, in a linear analysis sense, completely stable, and ran it in your in your computer for a, for sufficiently long. It always developed order one spiral structure and and, and fed into a bar. Um, and as you bought a bigger computer and ran simulations with more particles, you had to wait longer for this to happen. But it always happened, and that was that was all very nicely explained by this. Um, uh, amplification by self-gravity by factors of all, on the order of 100 to 1,000. In a globular cluster, the fundamental dipole mode uh, excites over a few crossing times. So it takes a little while to build up steam and in three crossing times, it hadn't, it hadn't come into equilibrium. It, this dipole, uh, uh, this excited dipole, materially accelerates the relaxation of the inner cluster the Balesco Leonard equation in principle unambiguously predicts the relaxation rate with self gravity, but it's hard to implement, especially for clusters. It's basically because um, of the difficulty of summing over all relevant resonant pairs. Uh, and this next conclusion relates to what I have not talked about, but is that I think there's, there's the possibility uh, of developing an alternative approach that uses the theory of Van Kampen modes uh, and the idea of classical equipartition of energy to understand the, the fluctuations, the thermal fluctuations uh, in stellar systems. Well, thanks for your patience and um, I hope there are questions. Thank, thank you very much, James. Um, Maria, are you going to Ask or shall I ask for questions and so on? Um, I think that you can ask. Okay. okay. Are there any questions? I cannot see any raised hands yet. Please speak up. <laughs> 
Okay, I cannot see any question. Can I ask a question then? Start, uh, can I start? Yep, something's so, rolling. Yeah, okay. I was wondering, uh, actually I had two questions. Um, as I'm an observer, I would like to think of probable ways of um, seeing the effects that you described in the actual clusters, uh, mm. other open classes or lobular classes. Um, do you think that would be at all possible? I mean, if we had clusters of different ages, for example, in the Magellan clouds, would it be possible if we had accurate enough um, proper motions and radial velocities to see any of these effects? If well, I think we, there's something uh, much observe... simpler. I, yeah, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't be looking at open clusters, and I, I would be looking at globular clusters using Gaia data. And I think the point is that if you that if you would look at such a cluster, you would find that it was, you would find that a mean field model would always be a bad descriptor. So what I would do is I would take my, I would take my globular cluster and I would compare it to, let us say, you know, the best mean field model I could get, which would be some kind of rotating mean field model and I would find that it had significantly more dipole distortion mm. than any model like that. But that, but, but that statistically, the distribution of, of dipole distortions amongst Gaia globular clusters, so that's this displacement in the middle with respect to the outside, right? Yeah. Would be similar to what I would get if I, let, if I, if I ran some n-body simulations for 10 crossing times. Mm, okay. So, um, so I think globular clusters will be less beautifully spherical than some people traditionally would have told you. And that is the signature that I, I would look for. So first. ellipticity, right? No, not it. So, well, the ellipticity is, is the quadrupole distortion, and the trouble with that is yeah, okay. that the cluster mm -hmm. will in fact be rotating slightly, and so in e, the mean field model will be slightly quadrupolar distorted. The mm -hmm. dipole distortion, though, will never occur in a mean field model, except through thermal noise. So um, that's, that's the middle displaced with respect to the outside. Yes. So do you, think, um, do you think that the Gaia accuracy we have now is good enough to test this? Or shall we have to wait for DR4 or something like that? I haven't done a quantitative thing, but the, mm. uh, I don't, we're not talking about a very subtle effect. So I suspect, I mean, the Gaia astrometer is amazing, right? And, yeah. and what we're basically, and you could do HST images as well. Basically, we're just talking about brilliant photometry. So you want to do it from space because you want, you want, you want to, um, you want to count stars, basically. You want to count, yes, yeah, this is a very important point. So you don't want to do this with integrated light because, because the giant stars um, pull, pull the light profile all over the place and it's, you know, not interesting. Yeah. It, 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 it's, 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 a, it's not relevant to this. You want to treat every star as a, as equal, all stars are equal, regardless of their luminosity. So you want to count stars. And that means you want to be able to resolve in as far as you can. Uh, so, but I think Gaia is the right machine. And I think HST is a good machine as well. Yeah, great. Yes, I have ideas now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the audience? Any other questions, please? Okay, uh, I have uh, one or two, maybe. Uh, should I go? Yeah, ahead? sure, sure, please, Maria. Okay, uh, so one is a rather trivial, perhaps, question. So uh, you were describing that you ran or Jun ran several many low number simulations. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what was the reason for that? And uh, I would have expected that you perhaps you would like to run a simulation with a large number of stars uh, for a long enough time. Uh, what was the reason for running many simulations just to suppress the random noise? 
Um, yeah, so the, de the, de the design criteria are that you want, you, you don't want too many particles because you want to be able to see relaxation. So, that, so, that, so sorry, let me start again. Um, I want the relaxation rate to be non-trivial because, uh, well, obviously I'm, I'm interested in computing diffusive fluxes. And if, if the relaxation rate is very small, I'm gonna to have to compute for a very long time in order to, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so um, and the, so the thing about small n simulations is they're very cheap because we want to do this with n body six. We we want to we want to do this with no with with in the most straightforward naive brute force way, right? So we want to do it by a direct summation of. of we don't want to use some tree code or something, which is is. Uh, is tending to suppress star star individual star star interactions. We want to do this with with n body six. We want to do this with a direct summation code, and that makes the expense of integration rise like the square of the number of particles, or the, 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 the expense of every force calculation go like the square of the number of particles. So keeping n down is good from that perspective. And it's also good because it means I don't have to integrate for so long in order to see some diffusion. So low N is good economically. Um, and, um, but of course it gives me a lot of noise. So I run lots of simulations to beat the noise down. Okay. Because, yes. the, because the cost of more simulations only goes like N, not like N cubed or whatever, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, yeah, right. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, there, there was also a question from Calliope da Sera uh, about ejection of stars, but she had to go so she cannot uh, ask herself. So mm -hmm. I don't know if these, uh, these all these, um, um, these new sort of uh, effects uh, would, uh, uh, affect the ejection of stars from clusters. The ejection of stars from clusters is something we try not to think about, right? And the reason yeah. is that it can't be described within the context of a diffusion equation. Um, so, so, so the point, what, what happens obviously with ejection is that, so the idea behind a diffusion equation is that the evolution happens through a more or less infinite number of very small changes. Now that is, that is a, a, a serious oversimplification of what really happens. Um, a very small uncorrelated changes. So in the real world, the changes are not that small and uh, they can lead to the catastrophic result that a particle gains positive energy and just goes. And as Spitzer pointed out a very long time ago, this is not reachable within the context of a diffusion equation. So I haven't got anything intelligent to say about that. It is, uh, I mean, when you do these simulations, it is a pain. It's a, it's a, it's a practical nuisance that stars um, become unbound. And because when they become unbound, you can't assign them actions anymore. Actions can only be assigned, by, assigned bound orbits. So they've sort of gone beyond infinity in action space. Um, and so I don't think I've got anything. I don't think I've got anything intelligent to say about the rate of ejection. I think the rate of ejection is probably fairly well. Dis so this, what I would think is, is is happens is this: is that stars move towards high energy using a diffusion equation where self-gravity is important and so on and so forth. Everything I've talked about, I think is kind of relevant. And then when they're at high energy, they suffer one, I think then they suffer one reasonably close encounter that pushes them off to infinity, very much as discussed by, you know, in the classical work by Hemel. So that's my sense of what happens is that this kind of stuff would only be important insofar as it it changes the rate at which you repopulate the fairly 
high energy part of the phase space and that if you want to calculate the rate at which people have boiled off um, you, you would continue to compute it in the traditional manner. I've also speculated about this. Um, if you have, because these dipole modes, which, so James has talked about the dipole uh, distortion, but you can actually also have these actual normal modes that get excited and they're very weakly damped. Weinberg showed that they're very weakly damped. They also have a very low pattern speed. So they actually oscillate very, very sluggishly on something like a hundred orbital times, let's say. That's the reason that they're weakly damped is because they don't have many stars to resonate with. But those stars with which they will resonate will be the ones on the outskirts of the cluster, the ones that are least weakly bound. And so if these dipole modes, which can be quite high amplitude, are pumping energy into those very weakly bound stars, they could potentially kick them out. Resonantly, yeah. So you're saying that a resonant interaction could be important in that final yeah. step. Um, I think there is a, also a question by uh, someone raising his hand, Harris. So yeah, it's me. Sorry, I ha I was muted. Sorry, Harry. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me ask you something to, to understand if I understand well what you're saying. Uh, this dipolar mode uh, you describe. Harry, we cannot hear you very well. Yes. Can you, do you, do you, can, hear you me? can you now? go closer? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank I'll you. go closer. Okay. Uh, if you, uh, I'm trying to, to to check if I understand well what you are saying about the this dipole mode. Is this dipole mode somehow induced in the initial condition of the encoding simulation, or is is it something that is arising uh, after some time due to to that resonation? Um. It I think it must be there in the Poisson noise. So if I would decompose the Poisson noise into multiples, I would get some small dipole. And I think the point is that this one grows. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the dipole. Self gravity makes it, it allows it to grow. Do you agree, Chris? Yes. So this dipole mode is um, it is seeded by the Poisson noise in the system. So you, you could excite this mode by, for example, if the globular cluster passed through the galactic disk, that would be one way to excite this mode, make the cluster slosh back and forth. You don't need to do that. It's, it comes purely from the Poisson noise. So the fact that you have a discrete number of particles in the system, a finite number of particles, means that there are these fluctuations in the potential. And, and that's essentially the, the, the external perturbation that drives the, that drives the, the mode itself. And then it, because the mode is, is naturally damped, because it, when it resonates with stars, it, it Landau damps, just like in a plasma, it will saturate at some level. Okay, thank you a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? Have you seen any other hands raised? So, um, yeah, Maria. So I have another one, but I don't know. <laughs> And the time has already passed, so if yeah, I can I can ask my question if everybody yes. agrees. Yeah, go ahead. That last okay. question. Okay. Uh, yes. So I was a little bit confused uh, when you showed us the comparison of the Hamilton's Chandra's and the N-body simulation results sure. uh, in the action space. And naively, I would have thought that uh, the results of the Hamilton's approach would have been emerged or would have been able to be seen in some part of the action space uh, that you find uh, from the simulations. So I thought that in some part of this uh, action phase space um, that you constructed from the input simulations, you mm -hmm. would be able to see some features of the Hamilton's approach. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe you can explain a little bit about this. I think the problem is that all, all the, at every point in action space, the 
near collisions and the far collisions, the far encounters are all contributing. There's nowhere where I can neglect the near, the, the mm -hmm. near encounters. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's right. So whether I'm in these different points of exit space is just am I in a very tightly bound orbit in the core, or am I far out uh, on a on an orbit that's sort of moving around the cluster as a whole? But in you, you can kind of see that in it's, in it's intuitively clear, I think, that in all doesn't matter what kind of orbit you're on, you will be interacting with some stars at close quarters and other stars you'll be interacting. Yeah. On the scale of the system. Okay. I, I think I think if your question was about um, uh, whether we could whether you could see some of Hamilton's results in the in the simulations, um, the, if you if you if you study the flux diagram, the, the simulation flux diagram, at, at the origin you at the origin you can see some um, you can see some reminiscence with um, reminiscence with uh, Hamilton's work. The issue is that um, because we are simulating at early times, um, which which is necessary to maintain the isochrome profile, right? Because your actions belong to the isochrome system. Mm -hmm. um, the we ha we, the, we 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 haven't. I don't think we've pr produced enough time for the system to burn into a fully stable state, which is which is why the arrows resemble uh, Chandrasekhar more than Hamilton. Uh, at the core, but but you can see that uh, at low JR, at somewhere near, uh, at low JR and L, at somewhere around near, here, mm -hmm. Jun's saying it's the same, yeah. it's similar to here, not like here. Yes. Oh, okay. They become more similar. The point is that the Belasco Linard theory is a theory of saturated noise, dressed saturated noise, and in these simulations, the noise has not yet had time to saturate. Mm. And that's on that's on account of they they're using a only ten to the three particles, so the, the secular evolution happens quite quickly. Okay, thank you. But then we only integrated for three or thereabouts crossing times, right? We should have integrated for longer with hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that, that was a mm, <laughs> not not very not very good. <laughs> but I, I think I think the next step should probably be n n is approximately ten to the four, uh, ten to the four stars, and then we go for maybe twenty crossing times and. You should be able to see saturation at that. So that's the, the next goal. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. If there are no more further questions, uh, let's thank our speaker again. We cannot clap, but I'm sure everybody would like to. So thank you very, very much. Uh, very much appreciated. Very, very interesting, very exciting stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.